I am here with a young man by the name of Paul Seiji. Hi, Tony. Mm. Hi, everybody. So, how, um, how did you get into music? Have you, have you, well, uh, no I've, way. I've been into music since I was uh, about seven um, when I started playing the cello. And, you started uh, playing cello when you were seven? I started playing cello when I was seven. You classically trained? Uh, yep, yeah, for about ten years. Okay. So uh, from there, I just um, well, I started playing the cello. Uh, I went to school playing the cello, um, and that was my life till I was about 17 years old. Uh, and then I started getting, while well, I was a teenager, I got interested in other sorts of music, obviously apart from classical. And um, yeah, by the time I was about 17, I was I, was, I became interested in making music because I, I just got bored of of playing the classical repertoire and and, and never creating anything, you know, mm. so uh, um, that's when I started getting interested in making music and started fiddling about with bits of equipment and um, borrowed some equipment and, and just started making, making beats on, on some sort of crappy old uh, MIDI sequences and, and sort of, you know, really terrible old Yamaha synths with the really tinny sounds and stuff and then okay. just sort of went from there. And what, um, what were your first forays into the music making? Um, I started making pretty much it was, it was house I was trying to make at the time, sort of a uh, US style house which is what I was into, garage okay. um, and uh, I did a couple of tracks which, which didn't come out, they weren't good enough and then uh, I eventually did one um, called Deeper um, which is a very original lyric <laughs> uh, and uh, that, yeah that came out uh, and then really m the, fir my fir the first release that I think that was uh, my first popular release was um, under the name Disorient um, and that was for Oren Walters' la then label okay. Mousetrap. Okay. Um, and then uh, about the same time I'd, I'd, I'd met um, G-Force through a mutual friend um, and he was uh, hooked up with the Reinforce guys. He'd already done a, a production for one of the Enforcers picture mm. discs, and um, and he was making you know he was making drum and bass, and I got interested in drum and bass around that time, and, and we got together and, and started doing some, some drum and bass as well. Was it a conscious decision to go from making drum and bass records on Reinforce to say, um, you know, doing what you're doing now? Um, not not at all. No. Uh, it, it was an accident, really, that my, my name became associated with drum and bass because, like I say, um, I was also very much into my US house, my vocal house, and um, I, was, I was still trying to make that at the same time that I was making those records for Reinforced, but uh, I just don't think they stood out as much as my drum and bass records did because sure. my drum and bass records were so weird that, um, yeah, they stood out, you know. So uh, the, the house things... Um, I suppose it eventually, you know, I ended up sticking the, all the various influences from drum and bass and house and everything together and ending up with, with what I've got now. So um, it, it wasn't any sort of conscious decision to move away from drum and bass. It was, uh, it was just a natural thing. And I think once the music started changing, um, I lost my interest in it. What got me into drum and bass in the first place was the, uh, the complex beats and, and, you know, like I say, breakbeat science, you know, and that by, I think, I blame Pulp Fiction for being the tune that, um, that's, that, that, you know, made everyone decide that it was suddenly okay to have a, a fast hip-hop beat and nothing else, you know, whereas before that, it, uh, there had always been um, innovation in the, in the beats and the rhythms and, and just the sounds, the programming. Do you still listen to drum bass? Um, yeah, I mean, I listen to it if I hear it or... Uh, um, yeah, obviously, you know, there's still some great tracks being made out there. Um, so, if, you know, if I hear them, then I, I appreciate those. And, and sometimes I, I like listening to the drum bass from the, the period that I loved it from. You know, mm -hmm. from sort of '94 through to '97. Um, First of all, what is Bugs in the Attic? What is it? Okay, Bugs Bugs in the Attic is a collective of, of um, producers. Uh, I said, yeah. Really, we're mainly producers. There's only the one serious musician, and that's Kaidi. Bugs pretty much evolved um, from when I met Orin, and we started. Uh, I, I put my first record out with him on his house label, and uh, uh, we just started working together basically, and just started jamming around at his house. And um, and then Orin started 
I, know, I think it was always his intention um, to build a collective. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I must say it was Orin who, who drove the whole thing and who's the kind of daddy of bugs, you know. Mm. And, and, and he, he collected people around him that he got on with well and, and you know, that were, were making good music as far as he's concerned. And, you know, it really it evolved completely organically like that, it, you know, just him inviting people over and, and then bringing their, you know, Cliff bringing his uh, SP1200 round mm. and, you know, Kaidi coming around with a Moog and just starting to jam over the top. And it was, you know, it really was just like a, a sort of friends smoking and jamming and, uh, you know, happy days. <laughs> How many of you are there? Um, now there's nine of us. Wow. Um, it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a funny sort of thing when people say, how many are you? Because um, it, it's sort of gone up and down. And uh, originally there was six, and we always talked about there being the six original members or whatever, but now, now we don't even bother saying that because it's, you know, it's, it's always been this organic thing. So, I mean, there might be 10 next year, you know, I don't sure. know. Maybe 11 again. Uh, yeah. I know you all produce records independently of, each yeah. of Bugs. So when you're together, when do you decide... Uh, when you do a Bugs production, who does what? Um, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting question, that really, because there's no, um, there is no set way of doing things, which does constantly amaze me as well that we've managed to carry on going like this when there is no real method mm -hmm. to the way that we do, do things as Bugs in the Attic. But I think it's just, uh, it's just accidental that... that um, that we can all work together and that we've always managed to find a, a, a consensus or a compromise between everybody that everyone's happy with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just down to the personalities um, and the fact that we all get on really well as mm -hmm. friends as well. So, um, yeah, when it's a Bugs production, it's, it's really like a free-for-all. Okay. And, um, you know, if it's a remix, for instance, and the parts will get handed out to everybody, everybody will... will jam at home on it or in the studio, come up with ideas and we'll play each other our ideas and say, you know, that's rubbish, that's good, um, let's go, you know. And, and like I say, we always tend to reach a consensus. What would you say is the, has been the most difficult production you've had to do as a production team, you know, both in terms of the work, the, the commission, the remix, or, um, but as well as the kind of journey to that track? Ah... Uh. Uh, oh, um, I think it was probably the Delata remix um, of Golden that we did because it, it that was the one that we did straight after Hold It Down, and um, and Hold It Down was such a, a sort of immediate success that it um, we suddenly sort of felt this pressure sure. to to come up with something um, that would top it, uh, and um, I don't know if we did, but uh, yeah, that was that was that really. But I think since then, anyway, we've, we've sort of realised that, um, you know, that it's stupid to feel that pressure anyway. All you should, all you should really do is just carry on and try and, um, you know, carry on being creative mm -hmm. and just, uh, you know, not worry about what people are expecting of you or anything sure. like that from a, uh, you know, from a, I don't know, a, a marketing point of view or something like that. You know, it really just comes back to music and, and vibing off what you've got there and, and making music. You know? mm -hmm. What are we about to hear? We're about to hear a remix I've just done of a, of a Scandinavian hip-hop thing called Sensational. Uh, and uh, this is what I've just finished. And uh, this is kind of where I'm, where my head's at. I'm curious to know where your head's at, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's just... I think it's a few a few different reasons that that criticism gets levelled, um, but I think if pe people were to see uh, that the dancing that goes on down at Co-op, for instance, um, it's quite obvious that it is danceable music. I mean, there's um, you know <laughs> there's a heavy, there's a heavy vibe at that club, and there's lots of people dancing and you know, lots lots of great dancers really getting mm -hmm. down. Um, I think. I think people may, you know, the majority of people might not really be um, open to, to thinking about it as dance music, just because it's um, it, it's uh, it's complicated rhythmically, but it also sounds electronic, sure. and that's and that's two things that aren't um, 
really that common in, in, in dance music. Whereas, for instance, um, you know, something that I always say about our music is that um, really the rhythms in it are nothing new. And, um, you know, rhythmically, everything's already been done anyway over, mm -hmm. over time, over history. Um, so, you know, the rhythms that you, you're hearing in, in Broken Beat are, um, you know, <laughs> African or mm -hmm. Latin or, or you, you know, they've all been done before, they just sound different. And, um, and even, even just funk, you know, listening, listening to funk records from, from the 70s, you'll hear a lot of the same rhythms that we're using, but um, because it's in a different context, I think people don't even pay attention to the fact that they're hearing a beat that's going... You know, it's because there's, there's a, you know, there's a funk guitar going away behind it and the vocal and the drums are low in the mix and everything, so it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't even register that you're listening to a beat that's, a, that's not a straight. Mm -hmm you know, two and four snare or something. Sure, you know. sure. If it was a slightly more organic sound, people might um, relax more into just feeling the music rather than analysing where the snares and kicks are and, sure. and things like that, you know. Um, and one thing I find is that w when I've been to places and played the music to, to audiences that really have no education about electronic music or dance music or, you know, modern youth culture or, or anything like that, and they literally... Um, just feeling the music that's, that they're hearing and not uh, not analysing it in any way, mm -hmm. um, then I find I get a much better response. Okay. That, that, you know, for instance, when I went to Puerto Rico and and people there were, um, like I said, have no not you know they don't really um, read the music press or they haven't been um, sort of educated into what okay this is hip hop this is R and B this is house mm -hmm. you know and they haven't had all these categories stuck in their head already um, they're hearing it to them it's all techno music you know mm -hmm. so you know they're just hearing it they're feeling it and they're dancing yeah and did you make some music while you were there yeah I made um, I made uh, I made a few tunes actually but only one of them's come out so far um, and that's uh, a record called Vasilando, um, and it's uh, it, all I did really was um, record a traditional Puerto Rican planer um, and stick a house beat underneath it. I, I, feel, I felt a little bit uncomfortable about it at the time, but um, but I think the re the response to the record was was good. So uh, why were you uncomfortable? Um, just a little uncomfortable with it because I was d um, doing something that uh, I. F I thought wasn't really me because I was supposed to be constantly pushing boundaries and sure. all these kind of things, but actually I was just no, I was just making a fun, danceable record. Mm -hmm. You know, you're gonna um, maybe continue doing records. Um, actually, there's uh, it's quite interesting what's happening over there at the moment because um, Orin Walters, the astronaut, he's he's out there at the moment and um, he's he's sort of developing further the. The, the links that we've got with the uh, with the Candela crew over there, who, mm. which is like a, a bar and um, sort of a, the, there's now a music studio there. So uh, we're, we're starting to work with some some local guys on some more original music rather than just uh, um, rehashing um, traditional music. Do you have a? Um, that I've, got, I've got a little yeah. I've got a little taste of uh, of one of the things that. Um, Orin's done recently on his on his last trip there. Yeah, uh, income. It's a it's a it's a funny one because, um, like I was saying before, you you know, getting getting stuck in in doing lots of remixes is tends tends to what you know what happens and definitely what happened to me um, because you you are you know trying to make your living from music you are um, constantly hustling and. Um, and remix work is the the easiest way to get short term cash, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's the best. I think it's something you've got to really keep a keep a handle on because um, it can affect your your creativity. Uh, the same same thing with DJing as well. Um, you know, DJing becomes like a. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't really consider myself a DJ. Um, I, I didn't get into this because of DJing. Um, I did mix records in my bedroom when I was about 16, 17. Mm. Like I said, I was buying lots of uh, garage records and, um, you know, listening to like Benji Candelario on Choice of M and, sure. and things like that. And like, wow, you know, listening to him mixing in key and holding mixes for three minutes and all this sort of thing. Um, 
so I, I was into it, but I never really sort of started playing properly until um, until I got the opportunity from having a name from production. Then I started getting gigs, and um, it was actually it was Digo who first sort of made me start DJing because uh, that's Digo from Four Hero. Digo, Digo yeah. from Four Hero. Yeah, mm -hmm. he uh, <clears throat> at the time I wasn't DJing, and he um, he just sort of. Um, said, right, you're coming with me to, to Japan on his next tour and took me out there. <laughs> so let me get this right. Okay, so <clears throat> apart from DJing in your bedroom when you're 17, 18, yeah. your next DJ gig was DJing with Digo in, in well, Japan. Yeah, my, my, DJ, my only DJ gig really up until going to Japan with Digo was playing in my bedroom, okay. basically. Um, it's a slight difference. That. Yeah, it was. And, um, and when I got out mm. there, I, it was a real like, baptism of fire. Um, mm. And I, I, was, I remember feeling really physically ill um, before I went on um, in my first gig. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't eat and I was rushing to the toilet and all sorts. And sure. It was horrible. But that, that week, you know, I had to learn fast. So um, I managed to get over my fear. So, um, yeah, since then I've, I've been getting gigs uh, off, off the back of my records. But um, I think I've, I've actually been DJing a little bit too much recently and that's that's taken the same way with remixing is taken away from um it, well just just the fact that i haven't actually made a, an original piece of music in about a year um, okay. or a year and a half or maybe i mean really? i think really loose lips was the the last production that i that i've done for myself um that i just knocked up sure for the for the hell of it you know have you started um on some new work um yeah i've i've uh i'm I've just started, really it's about the last sort of month or two months, um, I've really made a conscious effort to, uh, to start making sure that I, I make music for myself and, um, and uh, I've sort of invested a bit more money in, in, um, in, in sort of my home studio. I've just bought myself a, a Wurlitzer, so I'm getting that back from the restorers next oh, really? week and, and you know, going to learn to teach myself harmony and stuff like cool. that and, mm. you know, start writing songs and... Are you going to sing? Know, uh, if you're lucky. We'll <laughs> see. We'll see. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, for, for now I really want to get into, into writing music and, and songwriting and stuff like that. Not that you're going to be hearing lots of really nasty ballads straight away or anything like that, but at least... Um, yeah, some some um, some songs or, or some not, not even songs, sorry, just like some vocal uh, little scatty sort of vocal grooves mm. and stuff like that, you know. Any chance of getting some cello in the picture? That's yes, there, there'll probably be some cello coming back, but I've got to practice first because I haven't been playing for ten years, so I'm all out of tune. Okay. So unless I just use the auto tune, <laughs> then, uh, you could or a sample library. Yeah, that's it. Do you still have your cello from school? Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. It's just, it's, it, uh, I have actually played it. I, I was lying a little bit. Um, Phil Asher is always um, encouraging me to play. So he always, a couple of times he's recently, he's phoned me up and said, right, come down to the studio, bring your cello. So <laughs> I've gone down there and, and played some, you know, really minimal mm. string part that he's written for me on one of his remixes. And it sort of gets submerged right down in the mix or something. And, <laughs> you know, but it makes me feel good. So it's, um, Can you think of a... Any of the mixes offhand that you've got some cello on? On a Phil's records? Because um, I actually didn't know that, you see, so I'm going to go to my records uh, and see uh, if I can hear it. <laughs> uh, okay, there's the, the Jody Watley remix he did okay. recently. I'm, but like I say, I'm so low in the mix, you're not going to hear me anyway. <laughs> well, but it, sure but it felt good to have my name on a record playing cello. You know? What yeah. were your usual tools for making music? Um, really, since, since I started um, making electronic music, um, like I said, I started on, on bits of equipment that I borrowed and actually um, the very first bit, bits I, I used were like really basic uh, sequencer and, and synths that I can't even remember what they were. It was like DX something and um, the, the Yamaha sort of this flat thing, I don't know, I can't mm -hmm. remember. Um, th that taught me the basics. Then I then I actually met a guy um, He's a good friend of mine now who, uh, who who had a studio and I started using that studio and he had um, in Sonic sampler one of those really old ones um, and that sort of t showed me the basics of sampling on that and um, and he taught me how to use Cubase on the Atari and that okay. was the, the the main thing so from from then I, I uh, 
then I started using, uh, after I sort of got serious about my music, after I'd been using his studio for a while, I then uh, got an Emu sampler, an Emu 64, mm -hmm. and uh, just used that in an Atari. So for about five years, okay. six years, I, I just used um, just an Emu 64 and, and the Atari to sequence. Nice. Um, and any sort of keyboard sounds or anything like that, I'd, I'd use samples in the Emu. And I mean, really, my music was pretty much all samples at that point anyway. So. And, you'd, and you'll and you take what you've worked on and, and Daz would, one of That's the right, tracks, yeah. would mix the tracks. I'd, uh, yeah. I started doing my own mix downs in the early days, but they sounded horrible. So um, <laughs> as soon as there was a really good engineer around, uh, mm. I got him to help me. And so um, Daz IQ has been doing my mix downs since then. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I tend to, I, I do some basic writing um, at home, uh, just, you know, get some ideas together, maybe actually sort of develop the whole thing in terms of programming, do most of the programming at home and then take it to the studio to do recording of vocals or live stuff or, mm. or whatever and, and then a mix down. Really, I'm the sort of person who's, um, I, I'm at my most creative when I'm at home on my own at night in mm. my bedroom, that sort of thing, you know, I, if, I'm, if I'm a little bit under pressure and sort of like, okay, program a beat in front of us, I can't really, I can't really do sure. it, you know. So, um, yeah, that's why I work at home. Is there some kind of queuing system for Daz in terms of uh, mixing? Because, you know, you guys are quite busy. Yeah, he Is calls himself the hardest working man in show business or something like that, <laughs> I, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, he's very busy and, um, but, you know, he, still, he finds the time to do my stuff, so I'm, I'm happy. Mm. So, and now, so, um, <clears throat> you've got yourself a few nice bits of equipment. So, it includes the Fent, the, um, well, it's EP200, right? Mm. Yeah. What, yeah. Else did, what else did you get yourself? Um, well, actually, re recently, I just, um, I bought the Titanium G4 mm. as well. And uh, I had to say goodbye to the Atari because it was um, just starting to flake on me. Mm. And getting too old and, and um, keeping it repaired and all that kind of thing was just getting too long. So, uh, that, uh, but I must say, I really regret that now because um, the, the Atari was, um, there was something about it that I really loved and um, I haven't been finding the, the, the Mac as easy as I thought I would. You know? Have you pinpointed what it is about the Atari that you miss? Um, I think it's the, the, one thing about it was the, the tactile, when you, when you press the button on the mouse, it went clunk. Yeah. And you know, when you press the button on, a, on the Mac, it's kind of key. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's the, I don't know, <laughs> it sounds stupid, but there, there's something, I, I think the thing with, you know, if you're making music with computers and, and, um, and there's this interface between you and the music, uh, it, it helps to have some sort of manual input or, or some sort of tactile something mm -hmm. and the thing about the Atari was it was very immediate and the interface between you and the music didn't seem to be that great and then obviously there's the there's the, the clock aspect as well um, and there's sort of endless debate about this going back what and do forth you mean? about oh the MIDI clock in the Atari is better than the MIDI clock in the PC is better than the MIDI clock in the Mac and all this kind of thing I mean I don't know because I'm, I'm not really sort of technically into that stuff but there's definitely a feel to, to sequencing on the Atari that it's difficult to get from more sophisticated computers. Mm. And I don't know why that is. Um, they say it's because it's got a built-in MIDI port and then other people say it's because it's, uh, it's a bit less sophisticated so the, the MIDI gets shuffled a bit or something. Sure. But I don't know what it was, but there's a natural feel to programming on Atari that, um, that it's hard to get now from, from Mac and definitely you can't get from PC as far as I'm concerned. I've heard about some interesting bits of equipment like the uh, MPC, uh, some sort of MPC thing that you can, you know, ideas about using MPC to, you know, importing your MIDI files into MPC sure. so that you, you can then, um, you know, get that kind of old school swing back in your music when it's, when it's all feeling a bit square.